Hi, my name is Stephen Winter. I am a filmmaker and podcast maker. My feature films include Jason and Shirley from 2015 and Chocolate Babies from 1996 and the podcast, the fiction podcast, Adventures in New America, which was on the Night Vale Presents Network from 2019. The film I produced, Tarnation, which uh, is one of the first documentaries to ever go from a iMovie desktop in Texas to the New York Film Festival, the Sundance Film Festival, and the Cannes Film Festival, just got released on streaming on the Criterion channel and was the splash page for the channel last night. So in 1996, I made a feature film called Chocolate Babies. And the logline was Chocolate Babies is about a group of gussied up, HIV positive, black drag queens and trans ladies who become political terrorists. And every time I would tell people that, they would go, is it a documentary? And I went, no, we made it all up. It's a fictional um, piece based on my experiences with ACT UP in Chicago um, and various uh, black power organizations mixed with my experiences with the black drag queens and queers of Chicago's West Side as we gravitated around house music. And then I came to New York, um, made the feature film. Um, it was brilliant. And unlike everything else that had come before or after it in new queer cinema, um, which at that point, it still was a very uh, white male directed, dominated uh, a field, um, and we got to premiere at the Berlin Film Festival, which was a really big deal for a first time filmmaker, especially when it was black and gay. And everyone said we were going to win the top award, but we did not. And then we premiered at the San Francisco Frameline Film Festival, standing room only, incredible piece. And everybody said, you're going to win the award. And we did not. We went to South by Southwest back in the early days when it was still just a a funky festival. Um, they loved it and they gave us an honorable mention, um, but we did not win the top award. And at that time, there were a lot of different films talking about the queer experience from a white perspective and they were getting distribution and getting talks about in the Village Voice or what have you. Um, and I was around all those people and in that part of the industry and I could not get Chocolate Babies to be taken seriously. Um, and as a result, it never really got properly um, introduced to the world. Um, our variety review was like ridiculous. Um, and it became a cult VHS film that uh, people still to this day say, I, I was in the video store in Asheville, North Carolina, and I saw it and I loved it. Um, but it was really clear People actually said, you know, it's very clear what's going on here. You are being disenfranchised because you did not make, you made a queer film that did not center a white protagonist. And you also made it in a genre bending style that mixes comedy and drama and political satire. Um, and these are just not things that when you add black to it, um, you can uh, expect any kind of reward from outside of the joy of doing it. So. That was 1996 when that film premiered. And it wasn't until 2017 that Moonlight won Best Picture. So you can see how little things have changed, even though at this moment right now, it's clear that these are the kind of the voices that, will, uh, that we need going forward in order to understand anything about where we are right now, and especially how we got here on the, from the past. So I always did know that time would catch up a bit in some, in some regard. Um, and I'm glad I'm still alive to see it because a lot of black artists don't get that. I think the hesitations were purely about the fact that most of the protagonists were black and one of the protagonists was Asian, that there was no white people centered in the film at all. Um, you go back to The Living End by Greg Araki. Those are two HIV positive white guys who are running around doing stuff. Um, I don't need to go down to all the specifics, but you can see the one constant throughout the films that did get distribution at that time is that either they centered white male protagonists or it was Paris is Burning. And that was where the polls were. So if you wanted to talk about 
what black gay men were up to of any stripe. Um, you had Marlon Riggs, who I was lucky enough to get a masterclass from once. And you had Isaac Julian in England, who was being promoted by the arts establishment back there. Um, but there was nothing in America that made it clear that not only do black gay and queer people need representation in media, but that also that white people would be interested in this too. Um, that turned out to be quite wrong because you cut back to, you cut 15, 18 years later and every white kid in the world is saying, yeah, it's queen. And um, not quite knowing where they got that from perhaps. And now everybody knows. They got it from black gay people who, um, and black trans people who learned it from their black ancestors and uh, uh, mothers. Um, because black culture is American culture across the board. You know, the only, um, you know, just to use an example, the only musical genres that were invented in the 20, in, 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 um, in North America are jazz and hip hop. Um, and rock and roll being extension of, of, of gospel music. So uh, you can see how much black culture is centered in consumption, but black creators are not centered. Um, they prefer the white version of Little Richard's Tutti Frutti rather than the Little Richard version when they're bringing it to market. When I think back on how I felt about what it would be like to be a black queer maker who was not in the mainstream, but also, but much more entrenched in the art world, I was initially hopeful that that might create more space for me. And it was an unfortunate surprise that the white oligarchs that were in charge of what gets seen and what gets awarded were able to acknowledge that this work was important and vital, but did not wish to go any further than that. Um, I shouldn't maybe have not been quite so naive, but it was um, a bit of a surprise. We're recording this in June of 2020. And in the last month, a whole lot of white people finally were able to snap out of their days that they didn't understand what racism was. Because that is the, 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 the big lie of racism is that it, uh, against black people is that it doesn't exist anywhere. It just happens. It's just what is. And concurrent to that, um, a young, naive, hopeful white male protagonist is the go-to center for storytelling um, in the Hollywood film industry. Any deviation from that is always seen as something odd. Um, and in order for black people to emerge as commercial, not even commercial, just as a, 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 a vital storytellers in, in the film industry, we often have to subterfuge into certain tropes like the trickster or um, the angry person, um, the clown, the, um, the, the, the seer, and then try to make waves within that in, in, in those uh, narrow categories. We don't get to be seen as innocents we are seen as, from jump, wise beyond our years, <laughs> um, over-sexualized, um, et cetera. These things are very well known if you know how to look for them. Um, so when it comes to the black and the gay, <clears throat> somebody was joking like, is it against the rules now in television for a gay white character to not have an interracial relationship? because um, it is an easy way to put in a little uh, diversity by I have a gay white male character in this piece. Here's the boyfriend, he's black or brown. Um, and it reminded me of back in the 90s when every TV show and movie had a black female judge in the courtroom um, 
to a much greater degree than black female judges actually existed in the judicial system. And uh, the degree of which, as a for instance, you can slide in a black gay character or a black, black, black uh, or a Latinx character into the boyfriend role of a gay white um, protagonist is an easy way to check off a box without actually identifying or examining anything that that character has to do. So um, I think what I have done over the course of my career is try to create complex, interesting, uh, full, full, well-rounded and full-figured Black queer characters, male and female, um, and young filmmakers shall do the same. I learned it from Marlon Riggs. You can learn it from a plethora of other people, but um, maybe after this moment that has carved itself into our history and history line of white people no longer being able to say, oh, I don't, it just happens. Like, I guess it's, it's not here, it's not there. Racism is a thing, it's not anywhere, it just exists and we have to accept it and not deal with it. Hashtag for a minute and go away. That plausible, and I put plausible in those quotes, deniability is no longer an answer that people can cling to. So they're gonna to have to confront their biases and their preferences when they're, um, and, and their pre-existing stereotypes when they confront what it is about your work that they may find troubling or questioning um, and, and see what comes of that. Um, but it was the, the, core, the core racist against black people understanding that it doesn't exist anywhere, that it just is. <laughs> and if you can be colorblind and not look at it, then it's gonna be fine. Put Denzel in a Shakespeare movie with Kenneth Branagh and everything's okay. Um, that is hopefully now clearly part of our past that we can now move forward from and, and start from the beginning. This is a character that should have been on screen for a long time. Here he is now, let's put him out there. Marlon Riggs was an American filmmaker, educator, poet, and gay rights activist who created a series of extraordinary films that challenged not only the form of documentary, but what people are documenting when it comes to race and sexuality in America. Um, the three top uh, titles of his catalog are Color Adjustment, which is about black uh, imagery on television, ethnic notions that goes into black imagery throughout the commercial sphere, like Aunt Jemima, which just got challenged and overturned finally after 12 million years, and Tongues Untied, which is an hour long documentary. You've never seen an hour quite like it. That's not only about Marlon Riggs' emergence as a personal person, as a person, for being a black and gay person in a society where the black community would reject you for being gay, the gay community would reject you for being black. How do you exist in that world? Um, yeah, Tongues and Tide is like the, the pinnacle of what filmmaking can be. It is one of the best documentaries ever made. And Marlon Riggs was a master of his craft, and he died in 1994 at age 37 of age-related complications. He did more in 37 years than most people do their entire lives, and everybody is better off that he uh, left the legacy that he did. Um, so if you Google Marlon Riggs and have at his work, you will discover and learn a great deal about America culture and the impact of race and sexuality on a person's psyche. I went to undergrad at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in the late 80s, early 90s. And so I got to be taught by members of the community of outsiders who fought the civil rights movement, who fought in the 70s as they try to recover from what the 60s were about and we're now in their 40s and 50s in the 80s teaching. 
including an incredible um, African scholar named uh, African Af including an incredible scholar of African culture named Prexy Nesbitt. And the class was called Race and Anti-Racism. So we came in ready for like, oh, we're gonna learn some stuff. And the first thing that gentleman did is hand us a map of Africa with no names on it, no country names, and said, fill out this map. I mean, everyone knew where Egypt was, but I think maybe only a handful of us got past five countries. And uh, he was like, of the 50 some countries that existed in Africa at that time, the only way to pass this class is to be able to fill out this map in its entirety. And the first few sessions of that class were about learning, memorizing every country in Africa. And we finally got there where everyone was getting at least an A minus on that one. And then he handed us a map of the United States with no states or capitals and said, fill this out. And I want to say the class did better. We did do better, but you would still be surprised how many people did not know where all what all these states were called, much less what their capitals were. So we dug into that business. And then finally, now we're like a month into the class. Now we know pretty much what all the countries of Africa are. We've got most of the states and the capitals down. And he looked at us and said, so what have we learned about racism and anti-racism? Is that if you don't know where you are here in the United States, how are you going to know what's going on in Africa? And now let's pick up The Devil Finds Work by James Baldwin. Um, so that class opened me up to the understanding that in order to learn anything about your chosen profession, which in my case was filmmaking, you really got to open yourself up to what is going on in the world and be able to articulate and identify the specifics of everything. There is that, that to become a connoisseur of context, to become addicted to the nuances and to know what the capital of Georgia is. As he put it, you never know why, when you might have to show up at a courthouse at the capital of Georgia. Um, you ought to know off the top of your beam what it is. So when I became a professor of filmmaking, which kind of happened in a odd way, a friend of mine was teaching at Cornell and he got a gig teaching, tele well, directing some television. So we had to have someone jump in real quick. And I was like, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll do that. I can teach in, at Cornell. And um, so it was, I was teaching um, and not only applying lessons of my extensive knowledge of filmmaking and film history and, 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 all, all, and the theory behind it, but also I didn't, I didn't necessarily hand them a map of Africa and say, fill this out, but I did other things that were in line with that early core lesson that I had, that it's not enough just to know where to put the camera and how to deal with eye lines, how to talk to actors, how to do a, 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 a three act classical story screenplay. It's about knowing about your world um, and being mindful of the fact that that knowledge is what's going to fuel you for all of your other endeavors. I was raised with um, immigrant parents. My father was from the then Czechoslovakia and he came to the America escaping the Nazis. My mother was from the island of Jamaica and she came uh, to America to escape British colonial rule. And then they met in the 60s at a democratic fundraiser um, and raised me in, and my brother and sister in the classic bohemian style of which your purpose as an American here in this country is to reach back to where you came from or where there are people like you and always bring them forward as much as you can. You know, because immigrants know about having to go back and bring people forward. Um, an interracial couple who get married three years after it was now made legal to do so, know the importance of sticking with each other 
and other people like you um, when you can. I was also um, six foot four by the age of 13. So I was automatically conferred the, um, the status of leader, <laughs> you know, whether I was looking for that or not. And, you know, because people look up, they see who the tallest person is, they say, well, let's ask him the question. So it became part of my daily mandate to at least try to provide the answer. So um, the line between when I was a mentee and when I was a mentor is a little fluid because it was always a give and take as part of my uh, practice. Um, when I came to New York in the 90s, all the older gay men that I um, met, of course, had come through the AIDS crisis. And so they had lost phone books full of friends um, on a level that we can't comprehend. So to be able to befriend somebody in your 20s, in the 1990s, to be a queer person who could befriend a queer person in her 40s or 50s at that time was a very precious thing, um, even their 30s. So I didn't take any of it for granted. Um, but I also realized upon befriending and meeting people of that, of that generation that as much as they were mentoring me, I was also giving them something by being a young puppy who had not been touched by AIDS in the same way, who had not lost all their friends, who wasn't in a constant state of fear and grieving and PTSD, that my perspective was valuable for them because they had survivor guilt, they had all the things. So um, that was also a, a, a clear, there was no line between my artistic mentorship and the stuff that I was receiving in a social way, the stuff that I was involved in, in a political fashion, um, those all blended together. You know, it's part of just being an active citizen and living your life. So uh, yeah, that's fun. What else are you gonna talk about? Goddamn weather? Sometimes young black or young black and queer filmmakers ask me how to take advantage of this moment um, in this uh, moment of change where it seems like doors to their stories are opening and how to parlay that into more. And I say the way to start that is to stop thinking of it as a moment that you got to take advantage of. They told us this moment happened when Spike Lee released She's Got to Have It. They also told us this moment was happening in the 90s when the hood movies were coming out, the so-called hood movies. They told us this in the aughts when it became all about shoot it on your phone and then it's gonna open up. They told us this for Moonlight, which was yesterday. So ignore their ideas that they give to you that you only have one moment that you gotta sneak into because that causes um, the idea that there can only be so many and that you as a black queer filmmaker are in automatic competition with all the other black gay filmmakers. Only one shall survive. And you gotta, you know, do that showgirls thing of kick the girl on one side and punch the girl on the other one. If you stay standing, you get the job. That is not the way to move forward. Don't think of this as this moment that you gotta leap upon. Think of your life as a continuum that is linked to all the other lives and continuums that have come before you and that are going to become after you and are going to come because of you. What you do is you mentor the ones that need mentoring. You look to mentorship for the ones who uh, can do so. And you stand tall and proud of your comrades who are in the same position of trying to figure out how to tell their stories in what is the most complicated medium possible. It's not a book, it's not a piece of theater, although those are also incredibly complicated. It is a, a film which has upteen moving parts that all have to be decided upon by a group of like-minded people who are led by a director who's coming from a firm perspective and knows why their story is being told in this way at this time. And so that is the way you go forward it. Don't swallow the banana in the tailpipe that says this is some kind of moment and the door is going to close. There is no door. This year I am participating in the Queer Liberation March for Black Lives and Against Police Brutality because I have always understood that in order for this country to get to the place where they need to get to, 
we have to end white supremacy. We have to end the violence upon black lives, black female lives, and black trans bodies. And this year, it would appear that a whole lot of people are catching up on that. And if we're going to be able to solve the cosmic question of why is COVID, perhaps the answer is to end white supremacy.